Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 46th episode of Career Podcast. Today, I'm joined with Scott, Scott Thickman. Thickman? Oh, Thickman. oh sorry. I already mispronounced okay. it. I'm sorry. It's all right. You're good. <laughs> Scott Thickman. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and he's a visual developer and illustrator from Austin, Texas, from the United States. And before we move on to the questions, I just need to quickly point out one thing um, to the listeners who, are, who might be listening to this episode, is that today is a, the record... The date that we're recording this episode right now, episode 46, is 19th of March. And as a lot of you might know, or if you haven't known, that's the reason I'm trying to remind, is that the 14th of March was the anniversary of the podcast. And because of that, I started to give Photoshop course giveaway that is still, is you, you can still enter and you have like two days. You There's two days remaining on the... 6 p.m. plus 3 GMT, I'm going to announce the winner of the results on March 21st. And so, I mean, there's still a chance if you haven't still entered and you wanted to, or if there's someone else or a friend who might be interested, uh, you can check the post or in the Instagram of the Courier Podcast page. And we all of that out of the way, let's get to the questions. All right, first question. Um, give us a little introduction on how we got into visual arts and design. Sure. Uh just like probably every other artist, uh, when I was a kid, I picked up pencil and paper and loved it uh, and drew my heart out all the time. And then when I went to college. I, I did not go to college for, for art. Um, and uh, I was sort of I went another direction. And after college, uh, I, I was just miserable and wanted to... Um, move into, I actually just wanted to be an animator. I mean, like any kid, I wanted to, you know, that was infatuated with Disney. Uh, You know, that's what I wanted to do was Disney animation. And so that didn't pan out really well. I I, I made a portfolio and I sent it to 35 studios and this is back in the nineties. So there was no like send a link. You sent a physical portfolio and got 30, 36 uh, re- rejects uh, at the same time. So uh, it was it was very humbling at first. Uh, I started doing illustrations just to, you know, show people. And, and the web was starting to take off a little bit. So you could have an online presence, but you still send it by, oddly enough, fax. Uh, and so uh, I had a, a friend that worked at a, at a large bank in town and said, well, we're looking to somebody to do t-shirt designs for our, our annual picnic. And they, they paid well. And I did that for a few years, uh, doing their t-shirt designs. And then that became a whisper to another client that came to another client. And over time, I just sort of built, I mean, it was a lot of hard work, but it, it you know, sort of built a word of mouth that I did illustrations. And so I did that for, for quite some time. Um, and, uh, it was, that it, it, it was interesting and, and just, uh, you know, it, I, I felt like I was just tripping through uh, time into the next job to the next one. So that's kind of how that went. All right. And um, actually, funny enough, I one of the things that I really love about uh, in one of the fields of design and fashion design is I love t-shirt design, like designing a merch design, a special t-shirt design. Like that's one of my main things. And like yeah, it's it's such a limited canvas, like you know, as you could say, like t-shirts. But there's so much, you know, creativity and possibilities in just design of stuff for it. You know, mm. they're really cool. And um, were you originally studying art and design, or you were pursuing another career path? Let's say when I assume when your high school is finished, or when you were going to college, or maybe after college. Like, how was the journey for you in that regard? <laughs> wow. Uh, so, um, academically I'm terrible. Like I, I barely eked by in in all academic classes. Um, when I got to college, it was a constant struggle. You know, if I was in English class, I was, you know, doodling, but, uh, the environment I was in and grew up in lended more to doodling doesn't make you any money so the whole starving artist which is kind of a load of hooey um i I moved into i i was like well i don't know what to major in 
So I decided to major in religion and philosophy. So I took four years of Greek and four years of Hebrew and did lots and lots of uh, studies on, uh, uh, you know, different philosophers and just multitudes of classes in that when I was never happy. But I learned a lot. You, you, uh, both those, um, both those fields teach you about critical thinking, which is super helpful later on. Uh, and I think, I think what really changed my path in college was um, my philosophy teacher in our senior year said two things that really have still stuck with me. And that, that's like almost 30 years ago now. Um, and the first was you learn more and more about less and less to ultimately know you know nothing. And the second one is, he said, you don't go to college to make millions of dollars. You go to college to learn. And I, I successfully did that. Um, so when I graduated uh, college, I had a brief stint in grad school and couldn't stand it, dropped out. And just I just wasn't happy unless I was drawing. Uh, if I had a pencil in my hand, I got to draw. It was great. Uh, if I did anything else, which I did a ton of monotonous uh, dead end jobs uh, to keep afloat, it, I, um, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't happy or fulfilled. But I don't know anybody that's happy or fulfilled in a dead end job to begin with. But um, it uh, it it was it college just was a, a good time of learning. But it wasn't after that until I realized you know there's some practical applications uh, to art and how to how to actually make money at it or be you know be fi funded by your own own craft and love so uh, so college had a pretty pivotal point for learning not so much for art any elective i could take at college i took an art class but it wasn't until afterwards i got really serious so kind of got started a little later on that wow i mean that's actually interesting i never we know I never had anyone that's the first on the show actually that's someone yeah. who because i had a lot of people who of course they didn't first initially start with our art art kind mm -hmm. of like you know direction but uh it's pretty interesting that you started with philosophy and uh mm -hmm. theology studies like mm -hmm. i'm sure that it's in a sense inspired you in your works like later on like those type of oh. you know writings and stuff like mm -hmm. that all right pretty cool and um, with that out of the way, what is your main branch of design that you're focusing on? And tell us about your experience from the start of it until now. Sure. I hope you have about six hours for this. Uh, okay. So um, when I started out, uh, there was not much to um, computers. I mean, you, there was like, like I can remember Photoshop version one, uh, which was you know, you'd load up an image, it crash, you'd load up an image, crash. Of course, it's no different in Photoshop 2021. It still loads up and crashes, but that's another story. Uh, anyway, uh, what um, went, what, what I started doing that sort of was the hook is I didn't learn, uh, like my sketching ability at, when I first started out was pretty terrible. My, my concepts, I could you know, could create something in my head, but I couldn't really, I wasn't really good with executing um, images very well. So uh, I learned Adobe Illustrator, which is a vector-based program, and you use, uh, use a, uh, you know, almost a point and click to make your art. And I had fallen in love with like the flat design of stuff. There's an artist that I admire called Josh Agel, and his, he goes by Shag. Uh, so his last two letters of his last, first name and first two letters of his Last name, create S-H-A-G, and you can just go to his site, I think shag.com. But uh, Josh did a really flat, poppy, 50 style, and I was just mesmerized by it. So I would always draw my work that way. And uh, over time, and this is between working tons and tons of dead-end jobs. And so uh, in my spare time, there was a there was a forum because there was no there was no social media at the time. So there was a online forum called The Drawing Board. It was run by Shane Glines, who uh, had a hand in some of the Batman and Kim Possible stuff. Him and Bruce Tim uh, worked together. And in that board, anybody could join, but there were a lot of really good animators and illustrators through that. And we all sort of kind of bonded. We'd have a drawing challenge each week. And so I would enter the drawing challenge, and I would use that piece as a portfolio piece. And I'd put that piece in my 
in my paper portfolio and I'd send it out to various uh, agents and art directors and um, I, I would usually get nothing back. But there was one, I guess I'd been doing this for off and on for about two or three years. And one day uh, I got an inquiry from an agent who said, we'd love to work with you. Uh, we think your work is neat and unique. And this is over sending tons of stuff. And I said, well, that's great. And I was about to sign on with them. And then another agency messaged almost like two days later saying, no, we want to represent you. And uh, it was just a, all of a sudden, you know, I went from just barely making any money uh, and having to scramble for anything to actually, you know, having to turn jobs down because I couldn't, you know, I was, I was getting fed so much work. The big, big one for me was I got a call. My, my agent at the time reached out to the Wall Street Journal and said, look at this guy's work. And then I got a call from the Wall Street Journal saying, we'd love to work with you. And that was a very long and great relationship uh, with a with a big company that, you know, it, it's sort of like stepping stone. Once you got to that point, it was easy to kind of climb to the next level and the next level. So nothing has no good story doesn't have a few drama bits in it. So things were going great uh, for me and I was making enough money that I could uh, kind of finance everything and I didn't have to work dead end jobs anymore and I could move up from eating Raymond noodles to uh, at least the deluxe box of Raymond noodles. Um, and so things were good. And then the 2007 recession happened and all, I had invested so much time in print media that all uh, my clients within about two months went belly up. Even when Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal. He came in and just cleaned house and the art directors I had there and, and other various places, they just, they just went out of business. Also in 2007, the iPhone uh, was introduced, blogging was on the rise and print media was just dying. Um, and now it's kind of a novelty to, to even have print media. I mean, I can't tell you the last time I bought a magazine. So there was a lot of period of scrambling. I learned how to code. So I learned how to do websites, which led into a, a career of uh, teaching at a university for a little while and then moving on to UX uh, to the point where it was the same thing. I just wasn't happy. Uh, so my wife and I talked about it and financially we were okay for me to roll off. And I have resigned and I have been working tirelessly to rebuild a portfolio in a new style and a new fashion and try once again to enter into the animation uh, industry, which is uh, like a very high walled castle. But uh, I have a mentor from Netflix animation that uh, helps me every other week uh, try to put together better pictures and better portfolio. And that would catch me all the way up to 2021. I've skipped a bunch, but that's kind of those, those, those are the highlights. Yeah. And, um, so it was your, when you said you started learning coding, um, I assume it was like, and you said you went on for user experience. So it was front end mm -hmm. development in a sense, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that was kind of your first time you know, like coding anything, right? Like your first oh, yeah. entry. Yeah. Yeah. It was hell on earth. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> stand it, but. But I can now read and recognize JavaScript, and uh, I mean HTML, CSS is not a no, not foreign mm. words to me. So anything front end, I can do. I just I hated every minute of it because um, <laughs> uh, I am not yeah. a coder at all, and my code was never production ready, and it was full of bugs, and so it never worked well. But it was enough to kind of get me by in tight times. Pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, I just, I sometimes when I have people on and they say, and I figure out they're, they're kind of like multidisciplinary, even at some, you know, basic sense, you know, I always try to highlight that because the more I highlight it, the more it kind of reinforces the fact that, um, because you know how usually the, the whole psychology of young people, especially, I mean, I used to fall into the same trap myself. I mean, I, I'm still pretty young. What am I talking about? Um, but what I'm trying to say is that, um, people like think, for example, they make a mountain out of nothing, you know, when they want to learn something. That's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. Sorry if my words aren't connecting quite well. But, no, you're good. But like, I mean, you can, like you said, you have to be just 
learn just one area. I mean, yeah, it's good to focus, get laser focus on one thing. I mean, that's basically in, in the end what kind of you should do if you want to be successful at anything. But you can easily like learn multiple different like fields, like audio editing, video editing, web development, all of them. You can just be one man army of your whole show. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty good to know. And um, all right. How does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a project? Sure. Uh, so there's been a constant uh, since. So I started in the 90s. I know I'll look like I'm 21 or 19, but I'm a little bit older than that. Uh, so the design process has been the same. There's been a, a, a constant across, well, three-ish decades now, uh, which is a resource gathering time um, when I would get a brief from a client. Uh, like one time in Atlanta, I used to live in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, the Atlanta magazine said, hey, we want you to do a cover. It's, uh, it's for finding love in the town. And this is pre-dating uh, apps. So uh, there was ways you could kind of meet people online, but it was still kind of creepy and weird. Well, hell, it's creepy and weird now, but I mean, it's less creepy and weird. But anyway, uh, they, they said, can you come up with some concepts for a cover for that on how to meet people online? And I said, sure, yeah. So uh, since the dawn of any search engine, that has been my, my best friend uh, to be able to pull resources and... Um, you know, you, you just, you look over tons of stuff for that. And then once I kind of have a mood board done, uh, I'll, you know, it used to be you'd print them out and kind of, uh, you know, tack them up on a wall, but now I actually have an app that I use that, uh, that I just put all my images, uh, to a second screen and I'll look at it and I try to write down some keywords of what I see. Um, you know, obviously I'll look at the brief and it says, uh, you know, if it says we we're looking for something bright and poppy and we need it funny. Then I'll look at actually what, what makes funny colors, you know, what, what makes people, what would make people giggle, uh, lots and lots of bad puns and tons and tons of stuff just into a virtual garbage can. I mean, uh, there's, you know, there's things that sound so great and then it doesn't work or uh, this would be a great concept, but I get to draw on it and it doesn't work. So lots of stuff thrown in the garbage. And then after the resource gathering, I'll do a series of thumbnails, sometimes really lazy and I'll just pick one or two, but I try to stick to 50 uh, per project. Um, I'm not really worried about uh, doing things over and over. I'm just, I mean, it's just kind of been habit, but I'll pick around 50 uh, or I'll draw around 50 uh, for one concept and then I'll look at it and see what appeals to me. If it's for me, I kind of just pick one and stick with it. If it's for a client, uh, I usually deliver three uh, rough drafts and say, this is my, this is where my head's at. This is what I think it's going to look like. And then I get feedback from a client and we go through a, a revision period. And then after that, it's just, put on some good music and put your head down to the screen and turn, try to turn Wi-Fi off and leave social media alone and, uh, and work. Uh, but the harder part has always been the idea phase and the resource gathering. Um, just because you, it's kind of like, you know, a book with no words and you got to write it, you know, fill it up. It's just, it's tough. Uh, and, uh, but that, that does help because once you do have all your resource gathered, you're able to, um, you're able to kind of see a bigger picture and you can have those aha moments um, or I call them shower thoughts. You know, you've looked mm -hmm. at something so long and you're taking a shower and going, Oh, I could totally do that. Um, and then, you know, the idea is there. So that's the way I look at it. It's a lot of, a lot of resource, a lot of resource gathering and then the thumbnail period and then the back and forth with the client or, or yourself. And then just the execution, which is just work a lot of, a lot of clicking and, and drawing. Yep. That sums it up pretty well. And, um, all right, next question. Um, now in this section of the podcast, I want to ask you about some of your works in particular and maybe some sure. other miscellaneous stuff about your works. Um, so okay. one thing that caught my eye on your Instagram profile was, um, well, first sentence in your bio, I can always tell when movies use fake dinosaurs. Like, I mean, yes. it's, it's really fun. Like, 
it it completely portrays like a part a main part of your personality i guess and i think in a review of someone from wall street journal and kind of mentioned your um sense of humor and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's good to know and also all right now the main thing i want to ask clients include wall street journal dreamworks and conde nas mm -hmm. if i if i don't conde nas yeah conde nas um, they're they're uh well, actually, they own Reddit now, mm. but uh, for the longest time, they were just a magazine publisher. All right. And could you tell us a bit about the, your experience working with these companies? Sure. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal, most awesome time I've ever had. Uh, would it? I think all the art directors are gone that I worked with at the time. That it was, it was always a big rush, uh, like to the point where... It was so much fun. Uh, they would usually call in a panic around four and they're like, hey, listen, we have this concept. We need to have it approved by five. Can you get us three sketches in an hour? And I would dive into it. And um, and then they would at about five o'clock, they'd have a meeting, would be back and forth. And then they would say, OK, do this one. And we need about eight in the morning because uh, we got to go to print by nine. And so it was, you know, uh, how much coffee can I drink? And it was an all-nighter to pull it up. It was always so much fun. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, it, I ended up making a lot of friends that way uh, through that. And, uh, and it just, yeah, that one was a rush. The big one was uh, DreamWorks and uh, most specifically Shrek. So every time I say that, people will... Uh, put in their own implications. Like I was this big hotshot that worked, you know, danced around with Eddie Murphy and Mike Myers, which is not the case. So uh, here's the better story to getting to work for the big green ogre. Um, in the nineties, uh, that drawing board place I mentioned, uh, all of us would get together and everybody was fairly, I mean, there was a few people that were like lowly, uh, production assistants at like Nickelodeon or the Muppets. And, uh, you know, you would, uh, some people were, uh, you know, trying to get into like their own illustration group or, or trying to become animators. I mean, everybody was really fresh and green, but I made a lot of friends that way. Like it was my only art friends at the time. And so, uh, that was like 97, 98. Uh, and, you know, you it just like anywhere on any social media or any groups, you get to become closer friends with some people. And there was a guy named John that uh, said, you know, hey, I love your work. Uh, and man, I hope we can work together in the future sometime. And I was like, sure. Yeah. You know, I, I love, uh, you know, bouncing ideas off with you as well as well. And so a few years later, he called and said, Hey, you remember me? I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm working at an agency. I own one. And there's a client of mine that, uh, you, I would love for you to do the overflow work because, or they need an extra hand because they need somebody good with Adobe Illustrator. And I was like, Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, that's me. I know it backwards and forwards. And they said, well, it's an NDA. So I need you to sign it before we can tell you who the client is. And I was like, okay, sure. I'll not say a word. It's like, well, it's DreamWorks and it's Shrek. So after I screamed and ran around the house and was dancing for joy, uh, here's the, the part. It's still, I still got to work for DreamWorks. I still got to work on Shrek. The part I was tasked with was help, uh, like in the very first Shrek, where he's sitting on the toilet and he's flipping through the storybooks and there's all the pages of the, of the nursery rhymes on there. They needed extras for the interactive trivia game that went on to the dvd at the end of the movie back when dvds would have like those fun little hokey games and stuff so that's what i got to work on i did get to go to la i was in atlanta when i was when i got the job i did get to go to la i did get to hang out with some people but there was no i mean i was like a lowly peon in the lowest of low low i mean i didn't even get to go to the DreamWorks station i had to work at our the the their headquarters i worked at a where like at their studio and then they would send the files over to get the game ready uh but after i finished the job i was like so i do get to say i work for dreamworks and they're like yep and it was like and shrek and they're like yep and i was like okay sure i'll take it uh so that was a that was fun it was it was a lot of fun uh it's just that it was not 
it wasn't as like I always look at like animators, they just kind of hop on their little cloud and they they float to work where they all kind of sing together and they're happy and have a good time. I'm sure that is not the case uh, whatsoever. And it was not for me either. It was like, you know, go into a room with a bunch of cubicles and sit down and do your work and uh, put on some headphones and tune out everybody for eight hours. Um, the uh, uh, Condé Nast. So Condé Nast ran uh, tons of magazines like Modern Bride, a teen magazine, a, a Vogue, uh, Mary Claire. And at the time, I was doing little spot illustrations for uh, various small magazines that wanted me to do their horoscopes. Like, you know, it'd be like, you're going to, you're Scorpio and this is going to be your month to find love, blah, blah, blah. And I would do these little ones. And uh, over time, they got, um, you know, an art director would tell an art director who would tell an art director. And then you'd end up getting uh, work that way. Or you'd have one art director at one place that you'd worked with and gotten to pre be pretty good friends with. And then they'd move to a bigger firm and they would just take all the artists with them. And that that's the way I would do with that. Magazines were my favorite of all time because it usually took a month to do. So you get your brief on Monday of like the first. Uh, and then they were like, well, it's due by the 15th or the 20th. Um, and we need, you know, your vision, your, you know, there'd be a period of mail them your rough drafts. They come back, say, that's great. And then, um, then you would do the cleanups and then they say, well, we need to revise this. And so through all those, the common thread has always been to be extremely kind to everybody, uh, especially in an in a art world where things are pretty small. So I never burned any bridges. Um, I would put my foot down if there, was ever, um, if there was ever a time where I was getting screwed over. But for the most part, if you're really kind to clients, um, they tend to want to work with you uh, if you are like, like Superman at drawing, but like a complete cocky asshole. I don't know if you can say that jerk. Go back and edit that jerk. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. But, it's uh, fine. It's fine. You can okay. say anything if on the podcast. Okay. Well, if you're a complete jerk uh, like that, um, then, uh, you know, a lot of times clients don't want to work with you. Uh, but if you're, if you're kind and maybe you're not the best artist in the world, a lot of times that'll, that'll float, um, you know, for you uh, as far as getting, um, you know, more client work because people want to want to work with uh, people that are kind and have a can do attitude and do set boundaries, but aren't are jerks about it. So that's sort of um, it's sort of that, that's kind of my journey. Uh, and even uh, with The Wall Street Journal, most of my work was like postage size, you know, illustrations. They were teeny tiny. Um, and it's I, I love talking about this because it leaves so much to the imagination. If I just put up on my website, I work for DreamWorks. That's all I have to put. And people just assume all these things, which is not the case. And, and that's what I don't like about uh, social media is there's no room to kind of say, let me show you all the messy, nasty strings that went with me to be able to put that word there. Um, and so that that has always been you know, that's why I'm always pretty open about it. Sure. I got to work for DreamWorks. I didn't even get my name in the credits. Uh, and it was probably one of the lowliest jobs ever, but I loved every minute of it. And the big thing is that I treated it. I treated every job, whether it was small or large, like it was, uh, I would try to give it, you know, the, as much good and, and help that I could, uh, or, or emotion that I could pour into something, uh, within reason. So, um, uh, you know, if, I'd always said if I actually ever do get to animate on a feature or a TV show, even if I get the lowliest TV show and I'm working like on, on a prop, that's a haystack, I'll make it the best haystack ever. So that's the way I kind of look at it. So that's what those, the big clients are. And it's the same. I worked with Coke, Coca-Cola. I was a sketch artist. I would actually go in and then when they were having their idea phase, I would sit and sketch and kind of hand them. So they'd have a visual, um, and uh, agencies would call for like Toyota and Snapple. And so again, it would be like Toyota was like, we need some uh, diagrams to, to show. Uh, I, I did a lot of lifestyle works, like show a woman and a man getting ready to buy a car. And you know, we need this to be able to, for our designers to use as a visual. Uh, Snapple was, they said, hey, we, we want to do some risque pictures. 
of a, of a Snapple bottle and, and, you know, people doing not weird stuff, but just uh, like Snapple was trying to be the uh, Red Bull at the time. They, mm-hmm. This is before Red Bull was Red Bull. Um, and that would lead to, there's a, there's a pantyhose company called Spanx here, which is like <laughs> form fitting pantyhose. And uh, it, it's a big, it's a big deal. Like the lady that did it, um, she started with like nothing and now it's like an empire that she has. And, and, uh, so I got to do, you know, they, at, at first when they're trying to get their stuff off the ground, I got to, you know, have a hand in, in developing uh, those things. So that's where the clients are, uh, or what client life is like. It's just, it's usually messy. It's usually messy and very disorganized and, uh, sort of fly by the seat of your pants. All right. And so you've been at this industry for a while. For a long while, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. around a million years. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no, I didn't mean it like that. Um, yeah, I mean, you said the like you were designing some material for a game at the for a Shrek movie, like well, for the mm-hmm. DVD version. Like I remember, I it was I think around the time I was like six, seven years old because I remember when we used to buy DVDs, it had like mm-hmm. those menus you could change subtitles and all that. You know, yeah, they had extra content and feature before mm-hmm. netflix and youtube and all that it was yes fun time we we thought we were we had like we were on top of the world yeah that's that as, as it mm-hmm. gets we had no idea <laughs> all right um next question who are your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most sure um so more than anybody uh josh agel um who i mentioned before shag he was by far the probably the, he he probably had a pivotal movement in my life because when i saw his work i was like oh my god this is exactly this is that i had such an emotional connection with this like this is exactly what i want to do um artist today um let me pull up my favorites right quick because you know there's always a million yeah um but the, the the big ones the over the the ones that were sort of life changing so glenn keen was a big one that's that's everybody's right uh and then there was another guy that was working on disney at the same time that glenn was and i i hope i get his name right andre deha he was responsible for always drawing the skinny guy in all disney movies like timon and uh and the gesture from hunchback uh, they all have a certain type of style uh, to them. And so I always liked him growing up or, or the second wave of Disney Renaissance. Um, and then uh, today's artist, Beatrice Blue, man, I couldn't get enough of her work. Um, she's gorgeous. And also, oh, uh, Glenn Brogan and Ragnar. Um are uh three that and i can send you links to them too but Mm -hmm. they are um they were very influential uh when i first started and uh the now it just there's god there's just so many i guess one that sort of stands out more than any i just took a workshop under him was chris abel's uh and chris's work is he has such a definitive style and, and look and feeling. So uh, that's been a big one. Uh, and then I think, like, if I start naming off a ton of people, I'll just go down a rabbit hole. But I'm just going to flip through real quick just to make sure. Yeah, no, no worries. Else. No problem. <laughs> um, the other one that I, I can't get him up, enough of his work when he posts, and he posts often, is uh, Adam Murphy. Uh, mm-hmm. and uh, his work is is just super and then uh, one I love her work I don't have as much of emotional connection but I do with with her as a person is Loish um, who uh, I've never seen somebody that has an enormous amount of followers and people that uh, message her all the time and she takes the time to respond to almost everybody. So, I mean, I sent her a pretty long email just asking her some questions about how and what and how can I do this? And she actually wrote back um, a, a fairly lengthy email and it was it was quite nice. Um, and the other one, uh, the last one is Amanda Jolly, who's, uh, well, she's with Netflix now. She's, uh, she's kind of bounced all over the place. Um, 
her work, I've always just had such a huge emotional connection with, again, just her exaggerated features and her character designs. Uh, but she is another one that, you know, here's a big top dog that, or top, you know, top feeder fish, however you want to put that, uh, the best words for that. And, you know, I reached out to her and just said, hey, could I ask you a few questions, primarily on age, because uh, she had started in the industry a little bit older. Um, and uh, she was more than happy to, to chat with me. And, uh, and it was it was really nice because it's really uh, intimidating to reach out to people because you you think, oh, these big people don't have anything to uh, to say to lowly on me. But in the end, we're all just people. We put on our pants the same way, one leg at a time. So uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's it's not, I, I mean, everybody's the same. Yeah. Some people may have a God complex, but so that's, um, those, those are probably my bigger influences uh, are those guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a pretty interesting thing you pointed out that, um, like, it could be also the reverse effect of that, you know, as you said, like some people have gone complexes, some people also have this uh, kind of subconscious feeling that, oh, this artist is like, not just with artists, like even celebrities or even internet, uh, you know, basic popular famous people, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, but like, as you said, all of us are the same, like, you know, the, the, like, he, like he, the thing that matters is the human connection and what I'm... I know I sound really vague, but I'm just going to give an example, you know, to clear it out. I don't, I don't know what is wrong with me today, actually, because I feel like my sentences don't form very well. Um, like, when I started the podcast, um, I had really bad confidence issues. I was like, oh, I'm such a small page. I mean, why... I, I, was, I wasn't even confident to message people even with, like, two, three K followers. I don't even know why at that time I would care if someone has 400 thousand but i mean you know how the society and everything is you know i just it, subconsciously i couldn't help it you know but then mm -hmm. I, I was like you know i just started like you know messaging people and think i was like what's the worst that's gonna happen you just shoot your shot and um mm -hmm. and it's weird first i started for to work on my confidence in that sense i started like messaging like people with two to three k followers then it got higher and higher and someone with mm -hmm. like twenty five thousand followers i think a really like very famous like shoe designer for Adidas and like I'm not gonna mention his name but he basically um at the time told me that your following is too low and views and stuff like that and that's the reason I'm kind of which you know that kind of um messed with me <laughs> for a while yeah. but but then I started like um and by the way that was like I think yeah the first the, yeah that was the first time that it ever happened that directly you know mm -hmm. that kind of experience um but then as I got more content, I just started messaging anyone, regardless of their like following and like mm -hmm. some big names in the art scene. Like you know, I would I would just DM them like with four hundred thousand count, and he would just message me like quickly and say, "Hey, what's going on? I, oh, I'm sorry, my schedule's too <laughs> stuff like that." Or um, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, I got some very special people lined up for the month of March, um, which I'm really excited oh, cool. to. Which I would have never. All right. For a second, I was going to drop an F bomb. I would have never freaking <laughs> thought that you know I could ever be able to you know get them on my podcast. And well, here we are. And yeah, I mean, just as you you, you might be surprised that even a, a lot of these huge artists and you know influencers and content creators, if you just message them, like there's a high chance you're going to get a response back. You know, if like, yep. and those kind of people, it's so obvious that they love what they do that they even dedicate time to you know respond to they just love to be active in their field i mean that's the main thing like for example a yes. very good example is, is gary vaynerchuk i mean he's not a artist quote unquote but like he's very famous on going on different people's podcasts uh, like i check mm -hmm. a lot of his like appearances for when he talks about nft and on all of that he like he went on this guy's podcast which he had like 20 subscribers and you know like it when there when there's passion involved, like people just are ready to collaborate. You know, you you just gonna need to mm -hmm. just shoot your shot and see what happens. And yeah, I mean, that's sorry for everyone who it was a bit confusing. It just sounded like random bullshit motivational quotes, but I mean, um, yeah. All right, all right. Next question: What is the main subject of your artworks, and what made them interesting to you? um ask that again i just want to make sure i'm right, interpreting right. right 
um, what is the main subject of your artworks and what made them interesting to you? And by artwork, I don't mean necessarily the works you're commissioned because, I mean, the subjects are already, mm -hmm. you know, specified, but uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to your own personal projects. Uh, so, um, boy, I, there, I, I really like, I was trying to figure out what, I'm trying to give a more concrete answer than the one I want to give. I really like having a lot of fun in my art, I, I guess. And, and I like being like, so um, I, I guess a good way to put it is I like, I like trying to put a pun in my artwork, uh, like the bad dad jokes into uh, art. And I guess the way I look at it, when I was a child um, in the eighties, uh, the Muppets were huge. Um, like it, that, that was like, I mean, it just kind of took everything by storm. The Muppet show, show and Fraggle Rock and uh, Dark Crystal and um, Labyrinth. Uh, those were things I, I, you know, I just couldn't get enough of. And especially the Muppets, there was always a bad pun. Uh, there was always, and, and also uh, Jim Henson said that a lot of times they would write their jokes into a corner and they didn't have a gag to get it out or anything. So their answer was just to like blow a chicken out of a cannon. And that would be the punchline. Because how do you not laugh at a chicken being fired out of a cannon? Anyway, so uh, as um, as time went on, uh, uh, another big one that was a huge influence in my life that got to, I'll get to back to art in a minute, was um, I was uh, at a, uh, a big camping outing and uh somebody had uh their radio there and they were blaring something i'd never heard before and i was like what is that and they're like well it's a new group called run dmc and they're singing with an old group called aerosmith and they've remade the song walk this way and i couldn't get enough of it so i bought run dmc's cassette tape and probably listened to it till it completely wore out um and the not the puns, but the cleverness and the wittiness they put into their raps carried, has carried on all the way till now in just different forms. And I've always gone, that is so clever, uh, it, whether it's a pun or just a good riff on something. So I try to put that in my artwork a lot of times, like what's, what's, what's a funny story, a little bit of a quirk or a little bit of a of a humorous moment or some levity that I can put into stuff, whether it's a facial feature or a gesture. Uh, and with art, you don't have to make it overly complicated, uh, but to get it, you know, to get the punchline, uh, a lot of times you have to keep it simple. So I try to put that playfulness into my art a lot of times. Uh, I don't tend to go moody. I do every so often, but mainly my stuff is just fun. Um, and so when I'm drawing for myself, I, I love, uh, I've always loved really strong women and not like, you know, muscular, although that's great too. But like, for some reason, when I was a kid, uh, one of the first things that I ever kind of was, you know, something that turned on, you know, light switch that turned on to me was a uh, story of Helen Keller. And I couldn't get enough that, you know, this woman was blind and deaf and still went on to just kick much ass through uh through the world um you know uh and so there was stuff like that harriet tubman tubman and rosa parks were you know at the, just to see women who should just kind of roll over or were expected to roll over turned around and just were like no uh and they put their foot down and uh you know amelia earnhardt Susan B. Anthony, uh, all these are, you know, American icons, but they, just these people that just uh, were resilient. So I've always loved that uh, type of persona. So I'll try to put that into my work. And I don't, sometimes I do, but I don't try to oversex uh, women in my art. I try to just give them tough, you know, personas. Uh, and, and that has always been a, a favorite of mine. Uh, to do, but, you know, mainly people, I really, really enjoy people. I don't mind drawing animals at all, but I, I like people more because it's more of a challenge to me. 
and uh, in something fun or whimsical and, uh, you know, magical. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like magical, like Harry Potter waving a wand. It could just be something magical that connects to somebody. So, uh, but a lot of times I try to, I try to at least make sure there's a story going on in my work. Um, I, I'm pretty guilty about, well, I just wanted to make that look cool. But, you know, this day and age, I'm like, well, what's the motivation? What's the story? Because basically you're drawing a little actor uh, on the screen and you want that actor to connect with, uh, you know, the the people uh, on it that are viewing it. So uh, that's, that's kind of uh, where my head's at uh, with that. So, um, so mainly it's that, that's usually what I'll go to for my personal art and where that derives from is, is a uh, very, very strong, uh, strong willed women throughout history have, have been a big influence for that for me. All right. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I kind of see what you mean about that. Um, actually for me, um, since like I was like 10 or 11, I used to like basically women in, I used to read a lot of history. I was a history geek and like reading mm -hmm. about like, I think you mentioned Emily, Reinhardt was her name? The the female oh, yeah. pilot that tried to Earhart. travel. Yeah, yeah Earhart, sorry. Why did I say Ryan Reinhardt is an Overwatch character. I don't know why did I say that. Yeah. Um and of course unfortunately airplane crash. Like Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's I think an cliche and and kind of like a thing that niche that should be I think more mentioned in uh, entertainment and fiction as well. Um yeah, that that's gonna that's a really interesting subject with a lot of potential. And with that out of the way, let's move on to the next question. What technologies and softwares do you mostly use for your works? Sure. I religiously use Adobe Photoshop almost for everything. For decades, all I ever used was Adobe Illustrator. Uh, and now I use a mix of Photoshop and Blender, the, three, the free 3D modeling program. Uh, that's been a beast to learn but it's uh, been awesome to learn it. Uh, the, the ability to lay out something quickly in 3D and then bring it over to Photoshop and use it as a, as a guide uh, for if you're going to draw like a, a series of buildings or something, it makes it so much easier and faster uh, to do that. So the main two are Photoshop and Blender, but um, almost always Photoshop. And uh, I, use a, I use a tablet. Uh, it's, uh, it's a 24-inch XP pen. And the reason I didn't go with a Wacom, I was terrified that I'd get a Wacom, had invested all that money and never use it. So uh, for a fraction of the price, I went with XP Pen and I've got no complaints. I, I, I'm sure a Wacom does things better, but this does everything just fine. So those are the, the three, but I still carry, if I go out, I still carry a sketchbook and a pencil and using my go-to pencil, which is not the right one for artists, but I like as a mechanical pencil. Um, and I've got one with blue uh, lead and one with red lead. And, and I've, you know, if I've got a five minutes, I'll sketch. Due to the lockdown, I don't get out that much. So I haven't sketched as much as I used to, but I, I used to love to go to coffee shops and bars and draw people. Yeah. And, um, any advice and tips for a good portfolio and resume for artists? Sure. I, so to answer that, it's sort of what you brought up about reaching out to people. So in the world, there are gatekeepers. And they're usually known as HR or the, or the account executive, executive assistant. However, that is said now. Those are the people with the power. Um, they, they let you in or they don't let you in. So if your resume doesn't have the right buzzwords in it, they're probably just going to, you know, throw your uh, resume right out, skip right over it. In all the major jobs I've ever gotten, <clears throat> it was because I went around that and I got to know the people around that. And when I say got to know the people, I don't, if, if I can't be friends with somebody, I don't. Or, or if I can't have a connection with somebody, I don't really pursue it. So I, I guess one, I, I, this is not art related, but job related. So I was, uh, um, I had taken a class, a figure drawing class uh, later on in, in uh, like in the mid nineties at uh, UAB, which is University of Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, the teacher and I had gotten along pretty well. 
And then years later, I met him at a party and he's like, hey, I remember you and I heard you're doing like web design now. And I've always liked your artwork. Uh, would you consider teaching at UAB? And I was I was like jobless at the time because, you know, the recession had just completely just wiped me out. I was like, oh, yeah, I can work. And uh, so because of him who went to the head director at the art school in at UAB, they just hired me that way. So I never even saw a, a teacher. And then I used to do triathlons <clears throat> and I would always be racing next to a guy. And so we'd always kind of chit chat before or after a, uh, a, a race and he would constantly just beat the pants off of me. I could never catch him, which made it even more fun. But one day we were getting ready to go for the swim portion of the race. And we actually, they would take you out in a boat and they'd boat you out and you'd dive off in the boat and swim back to shore. And he was like, you know, we're looking for an artist. And I've been looking at your work at, on, oddly enough, at Facebook. Uh, would you consider working for us? And I was like, sure. So again, I never even, uh, I never even, I never even submitted a resume to them. Like they just kind of hired me because they saw my work on social media or they hired me because I was really funny or kind, you know, years beforehand. So I've always looked at you, me uh, as a living resume. Um, and, and what that means is being kind to every, you know, I've said this a hundred times, but it, it really is the magic key being kind to everybody. If you don't like the person or if there's no connection, there's no, it, it doesn't cost any money at all to be kind to somebody. And a lot of times it comes back as a, as a good thing uh, for you. So uh, I don't like, I try to be really authentic and I don't just like go, if like somebody has like a gabillion followers or super celebrity, I try to treat them the same way. If some, if I met somebody that didn't even know what a social media was or had drawn like three pictures, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's a big one for me. As far as a resume, like, uh, it's, it, it depends on who you ask. I've always had roughly about 20 images. Uh, I keep it on my website. Um, and I have a rotating in of about 20 or 25 images. You can see them all there. They're kind of, you know, archived, but for the most part, I just want, uh, somebody to be able to look at it, distinguish. Yes. We'd like to work with this person. No, we don't and move on. So I think 20 gives enough people to kind of glance and see your work. And if they want to see more, you know, they can click to see more. Uh, as far as the resume, I have one big one and it's, it's huge. And it's, it's sort of like a formality, but I think it's one that people skip. I always write a heartfelt cover letter. I don't write, I mean, I'm careful about what I write, but I don't write uh, a formal dear sir and or madam. Uh, if I'm applying somewhere, I look at, what somebody, you know, what their company is, what the vibe is. And I kind of structure things to that. Like if they're cool and chill, I'll write a cool and chill place. If they're like Disney or Nickelodeon, I still give a personal authentic cover letter, but I try to keep it a little more formal. And there is an app I've been using for forever called Grammarly. Uh, it's free, but if you, if you pay a little bit more, you can have the app and mm -hmm. it'll store all your documents. So I actually have like, templates of like, if I'm applying for a character design position, I actually already have that template done. So I'll, I'll kind of fill in the, the gaps, but I always try to, I, I know that an HR person's reading it, but I always try to give some kind of me in it. Uh, and it's kind of like going out on a date. You know, if you, if you have a date, even if it's casual in my brain, you kind of want to look your best and be on your best behavior. So I try to do that, but my best is still me. Um, it's just, I make sure that, you know, dress nice and whatever. So that, that's what I try to pull into the cover letter. But like I said, I truly believe a living resume. And also, uh, as far as Instagram and, uh, and a few other social media accounts I use, I try to be open and like, so if a recruiter sees me, they see who I am and I'll go, oh, I'd love to work with this person or go, eh, you know, maybe not. And so, you know, uh, I'm very open about um, my feelings. And also because uh, I'm a little bit older now, you know, uh, that is one that kind of eats at you a little bit. So I'm really open about that. And I talk about age and, and uh, working with 
Gen Z and millennials, <clears throat> which was weird because when I started, they were either non-existent or one or two. Uh, but uh, most of most of the people I've worked with, the art directors are are now you know a good fifteen years younger than me, which is fine. And again, I treat them like people, and they have always treated me like a people. So it, it's always been kind of good. But I guess the two big ones are your living resume, how you present yourself uh, on social media, can sometimes make or break your job. And always write a cover letter. I, it, it just it amazes me when people don't. Uh, so I always try to, I mean, it is kind of a pain in the ass to have to write them, but it also, it, it helps reflect you and why you want a job, uh, at said place. Yeah. I mean, I actually loved what you said about like in a nutshell, in if I could, yeah, basically if I want to wrap everything you said in a nutshell is the word authenticity. And, um, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like to add to that, I want to also mention that I I know it's good to always be formal. I mean, that's like the safest thing to do trying to mm -hmm. and i guess like you know they usually people find some cookie cutter template for a cover letter or resume and they try to like structure it in a way for that company it's not a bad thing but um here's the thing it's like a chicken without any flavor you know <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's no spice to it yes. add, add your own spice to it that's the thing mm -hmm. yes definitely and um all right let's move on to the next question what are you working on right now that you can tell us about what kind of project is it sure man wow that's a great one so um currently uh again to be completely open transparent i don't have uh clients um i'm in a very very good spot uh in life that my wife and i can let me work on building a portfolio there is a podcast put on by f ZD school. And of course, I can't remember the guy's name and I feel terrible about that. But my friend uh, recommended me to listen to it and I can send you the specific links to him. Um, in the podcast, uh, it's a guy that works for Star Wars um, and the concept. And he was talking about what goes into a concept portfolio. And he was talking about, yes, uh, uh, you know, drawing that cool castle with no story does look cool on social media. It does get you a lot of likes, but recruiters don't know what to do with that. Uh, people that are going, we need an artist for XYZ, don't know what to do with it. And he's like, for a good sound portfolio, making a project um, that is consistent, has a story, stays to a story. So uh, he, he was talking about reimagining a book or an old movie and bring it in today's terms. And I thought, okay, I need to do that. And I need to work on environments and I need to work on backgrounds and I need to work on character design and I need to work on um, what's called moment pieces or concepts or illustrations. How can I do all this? And I was like, well, I'll pick a movie. Well, so e it's easy to like pick Lord of the Rings because you get everything right. You, have, or, you know, trolls and quirks and wizards and, little hobbits and elves. And so that would be just a dream come true to do that, but it's done so much. And same thing with nursery rhymes. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, go to like Red Riding Hood and do their version of Red Riding Hood. So I did some brainstorming. I used to take Mondays are my research day. Like I don't draw at all, just like work uh, on research. And so I did a big brainstorm of what should I pick as a movie to reimagine. And so I picked one from the eighties. That was my favorite as a kid, which was splash, which was about a mermaid that gets to New York and it's got Tom Hanks and John Candy and Eugene Levy is the bad guy in it. And Daryl Hannah is the mermaid and they didn't use any special effects in it whatsoever. Uh, Daryl's in a uh, skin suit uh, for the mermaid part. And I thought I'll just do um, that as a, uh, as a, as a realization of a movie. So I'm trying to treat it as I got asked to do everything, the character design, the props, the backgrounds. Uh, and so I take each week and I do four uh, pieces from it a week. So like uh, today was to, to draw character concepts of what the Tom Hanks character looked like. Next week I'll work on the Dana, uh, Daryl Hannah character. Uh, you know, what does a moment piece look like? So I've watched the movie several times, but you know, trying to reimagine, well, how would this look like in 2021? And how would it look like as an animated movie? And how do you distinguish it from a movie that came out five years later, which is called The Little Mermaid? So um, you can't, if you give the mermaid red hair, well, you're finished because you just made Ariel, even if it was completely different. So uh, 
you know, how do you distinguish those things? So it's a lot of problem solving. Uh, I, I'm going to put things up over time on on uh, social media, but for now I haven't. It's not that I'm holding anything secret. I just kind of want the pieces to be sort of spot on. Uh, so that has been, you know, uh, I, I think they call it a BHAG, uh, big, hairy, audacious goal or big, hairy ass goal, however you want to say it. But it's um, that's been what I'm going to just focus on because it gives me evil scientist and plucky antagonist and his uh, his silly brother and a mermaid and a not mermaid. And you get to draw New York and you get to draw Cape Cod and you get to draw the ocean and uh, and some of those magic moments from New York, which, you know, a lot of times when a movie does it right, it captures it really well. And how do you keep it in an 80s vibe and and all this fun stuff to, to put in there? So that's what I've been. That's the big thing I've been working on. Uh, other than that, I try to just continuously improve. Um, and so with full disclosure, uh, I am 47 years old and uh, I have never thought, well, I've made it. I'm done. I've done the best I can do. And so I constantly take classes and workshops and uh, and always try to re not reinvent myself as far as everything, but it like my old work versus my new work. My old work was very angular and poppy, and now I try to go to more of an ink style with more dynamic. But the, the thing is that's a constant is I try to put me in it, which is generally playful and, and fun. And that was another thing with Splash. It is a playful and fun movie with just a little bit of drama, but it's more on the uh, just, you know, it's a love story. And uh, there's there's uh, mainly lightheartedness and so there's enough dark brooding stuff out there by other people so i'll just stick to the lighthearted stuff so all that to say that's the big project all right awesome looking forward to it. definitely post it on anything that comes up on instagram social sure. media to see what's going mm -hmm. on and um what area beside the area you're working on right now would you be interested to explore and learn in the future given if you had more free time uh, what, what area I would look at doing more if I had more free time. So I've got all the free time in the world right now, which is kind of awesome, but you would be surprised how quick it gets filled up by working. If I could do anything, I would split the day to learn more 3d modeling. Not so much that, uh, I, I don't know. I've just always loved building with that. Uh, and honestly, had I had unlimited funds, um, I would get, there's the VR setup and there's a program called Quill. And so you actually put on the headset, I, I've gotten to do a demo and actually there's a, there's a famous Vimeo video of Glenn Keen using one of the first versions of it. Uh, my friend has a VR set and he has the app. So you actually grab the controller. Yeah, I heard about it. On. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as you're in there, you're in the world. You're not, you're not looking at a screen. You're, you're building around you. And it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the, the crap that I put together in it was, was not fascinating. In fact, it was actually embarrassing how bad it was, but if I had the time I would, and of course the funds I would, I would invest in a very sound, uh, 3d or, or uh, VR system. And then I would, um, learn Quill. I think Q I L L is the name of the app. Um, so that would be, that would be fun, but, but mainly uh, the, the bucket list before I kick the bucket is to at least get to work for Disney once uh, on a, on a feature or a TV. Um, and, and just to build up, you know, I've always said, if I could just do one frame and one movie and have my names in the credit, it can be that big. I, I, I would, that, that would be the, the ultimate bucket list for me. And so that's what I'm working towards. Uh, I've got a little time as far as unlimited free time. And then, then after that, I, I, I'll probably go back into, uh, if I, if I don't do that, I'll move into a more of a creative design position, which it's always been kind of a fallback, but, uh, currently we're okay to, for me to, to do that. So, um, uh, most of my life is spent in Photoshop all day long and learning 3d or getting better at it. But if the ability to have VR and, and develop like augmented reality and, and build worlds within a, a 3d environment, because I think we'll move once mm -hmm. they kind of improve uh, VR, I think we'll all have like little goggles that we'll have on and 
screens will kind of go away, which actually yeah. probably wouldn't be a bad thing for energy use. But um, I think we'll we'll get to that point. We're not there yet, but um, once Apple probably cashes in on VR, mm-hmm. it'll probably you know it's just sort of like everything that when Apple builds it. You know, I'm not trying to fanboy out, but when they build it, that's when the critical mass comes. So mm-hmm. uh, we'll see. Uh, so so yeah, that's that's the long version of that question mm-hmm. for you. Yeah, awesome. And actually, um, I think another guest that I had on also mentioned the Quill program and like and a, a good mm-hmm. example they told me. Uh, I thought they yeah, I think they said that blew my mind. Like you know, that made me realize wow, the possibilities that is available is that for example, you could design a spaceship mm-hmm. in 3D. And you expand it, mm-hmm. and you can yes. design the interiors. That mm-hmm. that's just so amazing. Oh yeah, yep, yeah. I think we'll get there. We're not there yet, but I, I think mm-hmm. that'll just be probably, you know, story-driven, interactive, virtual reality environments, and and uh, you know that it that would be very exciting to get to to design. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, um, with everything that's been said and done on the, in this episode to conclude all we discussed, give us a roadmap for someone who's zero in visual arts and design and wanted to get to the place you are in terms of skill set. Like, um, basically, give us a roadmap step by step. What books, courses, okay. anything that could come to your mind? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I fall prey to what book, what brush, what program. And it, I'm going to go a different route, but I've got to pull up a quote to do it. I should have had this beforehand. But... Okay. So, uh, again, I'll, I will attempt to keep this brief. So, um, I am average is average comps. I, I, there's nothing superhuman about me or anything. And I, I say that because uh, when about eight years ago now, um, I did, uh, a famous mountain bike race, which starts in Canada and ends in Mexico. And, uh, it's 3000 miles across the continent. Wow. Divide. And it's not, it's not road. You're on trails and backwoods and there's bears and there's shifty looking people. And it is a race. You don't have help. Uh, nobody gives you a hand. Uh, nobody is there to hand you water. If your tire flattens out in the middle of the woods, well, you're responsible for it. And uh, um, I always wanted to do it. And at the time I was, you know, I I had no business even being on the bicycle. I'd rent a bike when I was a kid. And so the short version is I trained and trained and then I flew up to Banff and I raced and I got fourth place out of 180 people or fourth in my division. And, uh, And there's 180 people that raced that year and like hardly, I mean, half the field quit. And that was from people all over the world that I raced against. And before that, you know, like I, I couldn't even get up a hill. Whereas this race was like climbing Mount Everest seven times, uh, the height, I think it's 200,000 feet of elevation across like Colorado mountains and the, and the, uh, the Canada mountains. And again, I can't stress enough. There's, bears that are supposed to eat you uh on there and they are really weird shifty characters that don't want to have anything to do with you uh, while you're riding your bike through their little tiny towns so i look at art that way um just less physical so the longer thing is is that uh since i was at zero with a bike and this is what you're asking about somebody that's starting from zero um i was like well, okay, so it's 3,000 miles or right, the, the 2,743 miles. If I'm rounding up, there's 3,000 miles in this race. How am I going to do it? Well, the first thing I got to be able to do is ride really long on a bike. I got around 15 miles on my first training day and about passed out. So that didn't work out well. So what I did is I contracted out. I, I had a friend who was a coach who had done long distance cycling and he needed graphic design done for his business. And I was like, look, get me across this uh race and i will do all your graphic design so we we didn't exchange money we exchanged services he helped me learn about how to ride long distance and i helped him with his graphic designs that's the first thing is using you know a skill that you have um to help somebody out so they help you out second of all the training that i did had nothing to do with the best bike the right bike 
uh, it had a lot to do with diet and exercise and even exercise. I didn't go to a gym for any of this stuff. Like I had a jump rope and some weights, like a little flexi weights and stuff. And I had a, an old beat up bike that I rode till it about fell to pieces. Um, when I got to Canada, uh, I, I'd done enough, um, marketing on myself to get sponsored. I didn't have to pay for my bike and the bike was very nice. Uh, and, uh, I also had, uh, done fundraisers. This is back before GoFundMe and everything, um, or GoFundMe had gotten really, had not gotten popular. I kept a blog, uh, and a diary of everything I was doing every day. Uh, I would post, well, I'd post about four days a week, but I always was very open about all my training. And I didn't say, look at me, I'm the best cyclist. I was like, here's what I learned. Here's what I did. Here's what I gained. And over it, you would learn about the best bike part not like the flashiest bike part or the coolest bike part, just like, oh, this will help me, you know, get up. This gives me a mechanical advantage for climbing up mountains and stuff. So let's go all the way back to art. Um, it's the same thing. The best pencil or the best brush is the one you use. Uh, and I, I would, I, I mean, certainly, sure, there's, I, I've got a hundred Photoshop brushes and I've got course after course you can take, but it's really the one you take and stick with. Um, so if you are going to learn, uh, visual design, find, uh, a mentor or somebody that is reasonable and do your research heavily on this person or this, this school of thought and stick with it. Uh, if, you know, if you're going to keep a social media presence and you're at zero, don't like post something and get pissed off because it got like one like, and that was your mother. Um, who accidentally liked it and then unliked it later and then unfollowed you. I it don't, the way you should start is day one, I posted this, it's crap, but here's what I learned. And then day two, I posted this, it's crap, here's what I learned. Uh, there is a girl, a lady, a lady, um, let me find her, that I just absolutely love seeing her stuff. So her, uh, her name is Valerie Riker. Uh, she is under uh, Instagram as Valerie.draws.daily. Uh, and she draws daily and she writes about what she's doing, what she's learning, uh, how transparent and open it is that she is. And if you watch her progress over time, you just, you, you've just seen like this evolution. And so she's fascinating to watch. I did it for a while. Uh, on Instagram, actually, I did it for like two years. I'd post daily, but um, it got to the point where it was just it was wasn't serving me anymore. But as far as a course, um, the the best thing that I've ever learned is uh, drawing forms correctly in three D perspective. Um, the ability to draw a sphere and a cylinder and a cone and a box and um, and bend them in 3D space has been more valuable than anything else I've ever learned. The other thing that I am passionate about is design. And that is a lot different than just accuracy or figure drawing or gestures or uh, 3D modeling. Design to me is like the heart and uh, what connects to somebody. Um, like there's Disney movies that I see that I'm just like, all my heart, you know, there, this is the best thing ever. And other people are like, that's dumb. But to that person, they see something and they connect to. So, but the thing is, if you don't put your heart in it, you can tell a lot of times with movies that just kind of were copycats or uh, like the big one is like, I have like fallen in love with TikTok. It is so freaking fun to go and see little pigs uh, running around and puppies and kittens. And it's very positive and I never seen politics and it's wonderful for my brain. Um, but uh, I did notice that over time, there's a lot of copycats on TikTok. And so they're doing it just to get the likes um, and people can smell that a mile away. So, um, you know, for design, learning design is hard. Uh, and starting with that, um, there's people that, that do teach or have gum roads uh, that you can do for strictly design. The one that I like the most is Ty Carter. Um, his gum road account, his Patreon account are really good. And then Loish. Uh, for design is uh, her Patreon. She's $5 a month. And like every month she just kind of gives away the farm. Like she's literally 
spilling out everything that she knows does and just gives it away for well for five dollars a month you get all that on top of that you can ask her a question and she'll respond to it uh so those people uh for design to me just make it where you know you when I look at Lois's work, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, like I just want to live in that world. Uh, and same thing with Ty. Ty knows how to, there's a lot of tricks about like uh, learning big, medium, and small and stuff. And once you see it, you see it. The other big one, if you're going to go in visual design, is studying movies. And I'm, I don't mean just like sitting and going, oh yeah, look at that. Uh, like actually going shot by shot and looking at what makes a movie a movie. Probably one of the best one for visual design is like Breaking Bad, uh, like their stuff, their attention to detail to everything in that movie, not just, I mean, the story is great, but if you go and look at all the visual representation of the colors and how things are constructed and why they're constructed and what that, what's the meaning in every single piece, it's amazing. Uh, so those are, if you want to go the design route that, you know, I would, I would pick up going, uh, through, uh, you know, like study in visual design and what that means and composition and, and color and color theory a book that i would swear by which has disappeared oh there it is is this one um visions um all right and color and composition by, yep it's by hans h-a-n-s mm -hmm. bacher b-a-c-h-e-r and uh that book should be required reading for everybody. And you can usually, it's expensive as I'll get out. So on uh, Amazon, but if you go to a used bookstore, it's like not expensive at all. So that would be where I'd start. But I mean, mainly don't look at it as art, look at it as you're training a skill. And it really, you know, if, if the only pencil you have is like a number two lead pencil, just use the hell out of it, you know, and, and learn that. And, but don't go and buy the, 52 pencil set because somebody an influencer said on instagram you should get that pencil set because it doesn't matter you know if you don't if that pencil set sits in a in a box and never gets used it, it didn't help you so um i i think for forever i just used a a, a lead stick you know for for a lot of my uh, drawing stuff so that's um you know i, I if, if that answers the question, that's the long one, but, you know, just treat it, treat it as learning, mastering a skill, not trying to make art. I mean, art comes through it, but mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would do. Well, thank you so much for coming by this, we've come to the end and I'm going to be honest, this was like one of the most educational oh. episodes I had like mm -hmm. for a while. Like, I mean, by educational, I mean, not just, you know, drawing lessons but also a lot of like life lessons we can learn from your experience and um where can people contact you if they had any questions or want to you know check your work sure um i try to keep things consistent across the board so basically if you just go to a browser and type in uh s fig so s t is in tom h is in hello i is in igloo g is in girl dot art uh, that will, um, that will get you there. Or you can just type in my name. Uh, it, there's like two or three of us, but I used to come up to the top, but Scott and thick pen, and that'll get you anywhere. But Instagram's what I use a lot. TikTok's what I love. And, oh, before I forget, you were talking about life's things. So this is one quote that I live by. And, um, I, I meant to say this and got distracted. <laughs> no uh, problem. Cal Calvin Coolidge. Um, so somebody sent me this quote back in the nineties when I was trying to get started. And I have, I have had this in my brain since, since then, which is nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb and education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts persistence and determination uh, alone are omnipotent. And there's a lot of, you can argue a lot of that, but the thing is you can be smart and just kind of sit around with your arms folded and that's not going to get you where, and you can, um, you can have talent, but if you don't do anything with it, uh, it, it doesn't mean anything. And the same thing with uh, other ones, uh, genius, you know, I, I know lots of, lots of super smart people uh, that just don't, and educated people that don't do anything with their stuff. So yep. being persistent, you know, even when you're through your follies and stuff, it's good. So I wanted to get that one in, but yeah, s thick dot art, uh, gets me, get you anywhere. Or just my name, Scott Thickpin will usually I'll come up as a, as a Google search. 
All right. Well, that's about it, everyone who, ladies and gentlemen, who listened to this episode. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you in the next episode. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.